Calling all cars. The copyrighted program created for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 138 regarding a man wanted for murder. Describes 5 feet 7 inches. Weight about 150 pounds. This man is very noticeably cross-eyed. That's all. Rose and quick. In gathering the material for tonight's broadcast, the writer interviewed officers of the police department. One of the oldest police car drivers volunteered this story. Good, I... I'm glad to tell you all I know about this case. I owe a lot to Rio Grande. Of course, you know, we use your cracked gasoline in our police cars. No fooling, you've got a great gasoline. We've tried them all, but you can't beat Rio Grande cracked when you got to start your engine and get going in a hurry. Now, let me tell you a little experience. One night, we were cruising around as slow as possible in high gear... When all of a sudden, a car comes tearing around the corner at top speed and headed right for us. <laughs> Driver couldn't stop. Looked like a smash-up, sure. But I slammed down the throttle and our car shot ahead so fast, well, we kept in front of the speeding car by inches for half a block. Then the fellow turned down a side street and tried to make a getaway. We had to go clear around the block. But we counted on the power and speed in our Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And sure enough... We caught up with the speeder in two blocks. Rio Grande Crack gets the credit for emergency performance in saving us from a smash-up and for outspeeding a dangerous speeder. Is it any wonder that more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande Crack gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand? Try it in your own car. <laughs> Once more, it is our pleasure to present Captain Bert Wallace, head of the homicide squad of the Los Angeles Police Department. Captain Wallace. Good evening, friends. One of the most fascinating aspects of police work is the motive for crimes committed by non-professional criminals. These range all the way from insane jealousies of crimes of passion to murder where fear pulled the trigger of the gun. To this category of non-professional crimes belongs the case you are about to hear. The motive lay hidden in the delusions of grandeur upon which the circumscribed ego of the murderer fed. The murder he committed was not premeditated, but he was nevertheless a dangerous man, for when his carefully nurtured ego became the object of ridicule, he murdered. It is all the too frequent cases of this type which demand that your police officer be, practic be a practical psychologist as well as a good shot and fingerprint expert. Early one February evening in 1930, a Chrysler Coupe pulls up in front of an old whitewashed store at the corner of Clinton Street and Griffith Avenue in Los Angeles. Three men climb out, stand in huddled conversation at the curb. Boy, have I got the jitters. This business has got me all covered with goose pimples. Yeah, you're looking. Well, if it's all the same to you fellows, I'll be on my way. Thanks for the lift. Don't mention it. Sorry you won't come along with us. Yeah, yeah, why don't you? I'd like to, but I've got things to do. Thanks anyway. Okay. Take care of yourself. So long. So long. Seems like a nice guy. Too bad he didn't want to play. Well, let's get going. You think it's all right? Sure it's all right. Say, to hear you go on, you'd think we were a couple of mugs out to rob a bank or something. Well, you know how tough the law is about speakeasies and crap games in this town. I'd sure hate to get picked up. Don't worry. You won't get into any trouble. I've been here lots of times. I know the joint. Come on, let's go. Okay. Every time we feel like a little drink of beer or something, we got to sneak around in dark alleys and hold our breath. <laughs> All right. Lay off the philosophy. Here's the alleyway that leads up to the joint. Follow me. Leon McDuff. What's up? There's a guy standing in that shadow. Maybe it's the law. And what are we waiting for? Let's go back. No good. He's seen us. Here he comes. I knew something was going to happen. Oh, there. shut up. If you ask what we're doing, well, we're looking for Mr. Jones or something. Yeah, an original thought. Hold it. You'll know in a second. Hello, fellas. Mind if I talk to you a minute? Why, uh, no. Of course not. What's on your mind? I want to talk to Murphy. Which one of you is Murphy? He knows your name, Jim. Yeah, that's funny. Are you Murphy? That's my name. What do you want? I want you to put your hands up. What? I said put up your hands. I've got a gun. You don't say. <laughs> well, of all the... Will you look at this guy's eyes, Bob? 
Oh, they're so crossed, he couldn't hit the side of a barn with a shotgun. Now, listen. Don't you fellas make me shoot. I'll get a gun and I'll, I'll sure use it if you don't put your hands up. Oh, put that toy away and beat it before I slap your wrist. Watch it, Jim. He might mean it. Why, he's nothing but a silly-looking kid. He wouldn't shoot a... Oh, 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 You shot him. You shot Jim and he didn't do anything. Oh, oh. I told you to do it. I told you not to laugh at me. What's going on? Oh, oh. Don't you come over here. Oh, I don't want to have to shoot sorry. you too, so stay away. I shot them and I'll shoot you oh. too if you don't go away. I'll shoot you too. Oh. <laughs> Shouting at the top of his lungs, the cross-eyed gunman runs down the alley and disappears into the darkness, the still smoking gun in his hands. The stranger, who had said goodbye to Murphy and Leslie just a few minutes before, rushes across the street to find the two men sitting on the running board of their car, blood pouring from wounds in their stomachs. Murphy dispatches him to call for an ambulance and then lapses into a coma, from which he emerges several moments later. He turns to Leslie. Bob, are you all right? I, I don't know. My, my stomach's on fire. I... I don't feel so good. Oh, wish that guy would hurry with an amp. So do I. I can't stand this much long. It's burning. Listen, your maybe that's it now. Oh. Hang on, Bob. You gotta hang on. I can't stand it, Jim. It's burning too much. Oh. 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 Hey, where's that guy that called? I wonder. Probably scared to come oh. back. Here they are. Uh, get us to a hospital. Hurry. All right, fellow. Oh. You'll be okay in a jiffy. Oh. Who plugged you? I don't know. Please, hurry. Get him over to Georgia, Bill. They hit bad. Right. All right, Slim. You can bring that stretcher over here. Better make it two. We got a full house. Rush to Georgia Street receiving hospital. The two men are operated on and the bullets removed from their bodies. And a few minutes later, Lieutenant Lefty James, head of the gangster squad, in company with Captain Blaine Steed, questions them. Now, how do you feel? How'd you feel with a slug in your stomach? Not so good, I guess. Who did it? I don't know. How about you? Can you tell who shot you? I, I never saw the fellow before in my life. Now, listen, boys. There's no use in your trying to clam up on us. Uh, we coppers are your friends. All we want to do is find out who's behind us. Honest, honest, I don't know who it was. He, he just stepped up and told us to put our hands up. Did you do it? No, we... He's, he's telling the straight goods, Cap. Neither one of us knows a guy. I can't figure you fellows out. What have you got to hide? This probably means the finish for both of you, and that you won't talk. Listen, officer. That kid lying there is a butcher. He's been out of work, but he's no hijacker. Neither am I. I run a rooming house over at 1625 Juanita Street. If you don't believe me, go over there and check up on me. All right, Murphy. Supposing we believe. Can you tell us anything about the guy that did it? Well, all I know is he's so cockeyed, but nobody take him seriously. I didn't, and look what happened. But I'll tell you this much. I'd know him in a million if I ever saw him again. You get the cockeyedest looking guy you can find, and he's it. And while the search for a cockeyed gunman begins, two officers combing the Griffith and Clinton district find the Chevrolet Coupe parked a block away from the scene of the shooting, bearing the registration of a Mrs. Vera Smith of 734 Stanford Avenue. Upon repeated inquiries in the vicinity, it is discovered that no Mrs. Smith is known. And following up this lead, the two officers arrive at the address on Stanford Avenue. Here we are. Yeah, hit the buzzer. Okay. It isn't a buzzer, it's a bell. All right, same thing in the long run. Yes? Are you Mrs. Vera Smith? I am. And you look like police officers. That's right, lady, we are. Have you any news about my car? Uh, yes. That's what we came to see you about. Then you found it. Oh, I'm so glad. I was sure I'd never see my little car again, and it's the pride and joy of my life. I'd have... Yes, of course. If you'll pardon my interrupting you, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, of course. And we have your car in our possession, Mrs. Smith. What we want to know is how did it get to the corner of Clinton and Griffith, and what was it doing there? Well, I don't know. It was stolen, you know, and so naturally I reported it. Well, pardon me. Then... You say your car had been stolen? Why, yes. Isn't that what you came to see me about? No, ma'am. We came to find out what your car was doing over by the scene of a shooting tonight. We found it parked a block away. Well, I don't know. I only know that it was stolen. When was then... it stolen, Mrs. Smith? Well, tonight sometime. How did you know it had been stolen? Well, well, perhaps I'd better tell you the whole story. That's a good idea, ma'am. Well, last night, an acquaintance of mine, a man I've known for some time, came What's to the house... What's his name? And... Uh, Fulton. Red Fulton. <laughs> I don't see what difference that can possibly make. It may. Go on with your story. Well... As I was saying, this friend came over last night and asked if he could borrow my car. 
He said his was in a garage and he had to go somewhere, so I said, I guess so. And? Well, well, he had a man with him, and well, I've got to admit I didn't like his look. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, there wasn't really anything wrong with him, but, well, I just didn't like his look. And the two of them drank some beer here, and then they left, and... With your car? Yes. And how do you figure it was stolen? Well, I'm coming to that if you'll give me time. Anyway, about an hour ago, Red called me and said that my car had been stolen, so naturally, that's what I thought you were here for. Uh, where does this Red Fulton live, Mrs. Smith? Well, I don't see why I should tell you that. He had nothing to do with this, I'm sure. Well, probably right, but suppose you tell us his address anyway. Well, of course, if you say it that way, what else can I do? Exactly. Well, he runs a rooming house at 721 8th Street. You'll find him there. Thanks, Mrs. Smith. Come on, Ed. Let's talk to Fulton. <laughs> At headquarters, the two officers report their findings, and a search is immediately started for the missing Red Fulton. And then, less than an hour later, the phone in the homicide office is answered by a sleepy officer. Hello. Homicide detail. Hart speaking. This is attorney Ray Reams, Hart. I'm over at my office, and I've got a fellow over here that you want to see. Who's that? Red Fulton. What? Yes. He says he's willing to come over and talk, but he says he doesn't know much. Send him over right away, will you? I'll tell the captain. He'll be glad to hear this. Okay. He'll be over in about 15 minutes. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Fulton. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Smoke? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, oh, maybe I would. Thanks. Sure. Help yourself. Huh. Well, Fulton, what's this all about? I don't know. All I know is that when I stopped in at Vera's tonight, she said you fellas were looking for me, and I knew I hadn't done nothing, so I came over. Hmm, that was a smart thing to do, Fulton. What's all this about Mrs. Smith's car being stolen from you? Well, like I told her, I parked it over by my place, and a little while later, when I came out, it was gone. That's all I know, honest. Who was the fellow that you had over at Vera's last night? Oh, he was a young fellow that used to room at my place been out of work, and I was sorry for him, so I took him up for a bottle of beer and a bite to eat, that's all. He doesn't happen to be cross-eyed, does he? No, his eyes are all right. Uh, Mrs. Smith tells us that he wore heavy glasses. Why? Well, he has a piece of steel in his eye, and he's been wearing them for that. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, Fulton, I can't list you as a suspect very well. Your eyes are certainly good enough. You said it, Cap. Yeah, I guess you might as well run along. If I want you for anything, I can reach you at your rooming house. Yeah, any time, Cap. All right. Thanks for coming in. Oh, pardon me. Hello. Yeah, Steve talking. Yes. I see. All right, thanks. Well, Fulton, it's a lucky thing you're in the clear on this deal. How's that, Cap? The younger of those two fellows, Bob Leslie, just died, which makes this a murder. <laughs> Broadcast to all points. Be on the lookout for a cross-eyed man about 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighing 150 pounds. He is wanted for murder. Calling all cars. Attention all cars. Wanted for murder. Man, 5 feet 7, 150 pounds. Very cross-eyed. This man is armed. Pick up all suspects answering this description. That is all. Yeah, that's a hard one, Frank. A cross-eyed gunman. <laughs> And boy, I'd sure hate to be near him when he started shooting. Well, if you could figure out where he was looking, it might not be so bad. Yeah, if. Now, you know, the more I think about it, the more I realize you cops ain't in the softest racking in the world. And I used to think maybe I'd join the force. That is, they let me, of course. The more I read about these killers and stuff, the less I like the idea. Oh, it's not so bad, Eddie. Free rides on trolley cars, apples from the fruit peddlers. <laughs> it's only when you get in a tough spot that you sometimes wish you were a drug clerk or something like you. Oh, wait a minute, Frank. I got a customer. Oh, yes, sir. Give me chocolate soda. Not too much chocolate in it. Yes, sir, with you in a minute. Hey, Frank, take a look at that guy. He's got cross eyes. Thanks, Eddie. Go ahead with your business. I'll look him over. Hey, are you making me a soda? I have a little social gap there. How about it? Right away, sir. I'm sorry. What's the matter, buddy? You in a hurry? Sure, I'm in a hurry. I'm not used to sitting around soda fountains waiting all day for a little service. What's your name? What's that to you? Well, maybe nothing, maybe plenty. I'd advise you not to play tough boy, though. What's your name? Now, look here. You may be a cop or, or an officer, but that doesn't give you any right to go around bulldozing taxpayers. I got nothing to hide, but I don't see any reason Save for that. Save that soda, Eddie. I'm taking your customer for a little trip. Huh? You and I are going down to headquarters and have a talk with the lieutenant. I don't want to talk to the lieutenant. I know, but maybe he wants to talk to you. Come on. Uh, he'll 
just relax for a moment. We'll get this over with. I only want to ask you a few questions. In the first place, what's your name? He doesn't feel like telling us, Lieutenant Condifer. That's the main reason I brought him in. That and the eyes. I see. Now, look, mister, whoever you are. You may not know it, but you're breaking the law right now. How? By refusing to answer questions. Well, of course, it's... Now, it's not that I care whether you know my name or not, but, well, there's there's another party who'd like to know it, and, and if they did, it would be terrible for me. I see. Well, I can assure you that we're not in the private detective business, if that's what you're afraid of. Well, in that case, my name's Joe. Joe Griddle. And where were you last night, Mr. Griddle? About nine o'clock. Uh, do I... Do I have to tell you that? Well, it would help. Well, uh, look here, fellas. I'll tell you the truth if you'll promise not to give me away. That depends on what you tell us. Well, of course. But you see, it's like this. Now, my ex-wife's in town, and she's looking for me. And when she's on the war path, well, I can't tell you how bad she is, but she's something awful. So, naturally, I, I'm not anxious to have her find me. How about last night? Well, oh, I guess it won't matter. I was over at a friend's house most of the evening. A girlfriend, Mr. Gridden? Mm, yeah. Oh, and she'd be sore as the devil if anyone was to know because, well, you see, she's, she's sort of married life. Mm, I uh, think I understand. Would your uh, friend have any objection to verifying the fact that you were there last night? Uh, that is, between the hours of 8 and 10.30. Well, I, I guess if it's necessary, she might do it. Only she'll be sore. Suppose you give us the telephone number and we'll check your story. If it fits, off you go. That all right? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Only she's sure going to be sore at me, man. Is she going to be sore? A call to the frightened Lothario's girlfriend results in complete corroboration of his whereabouts at the time of the shooting. And this, together with the fact that aside from the cross eyes, the soda-drinking Mr. Griddle fits none of the other descriptions as to weight and height, leads to his release and the end of clue number one. But Officer Smith is not to be discouraged by this. During the next six hours, four more cross-eyed men have been dragged to Condapper's office, questioned, only to be released again. And late that evening, it becomes apparent to Smith that a cross-eyed man is no novelty in the city of Los Angeles. Leaving Condapper's office for the fifth time that day, he starts once again on his search. It is in front of an employment agency on East 5th Street that he spots his sixth pair of cross eyes standing in line waiting his turn at the window. Moving past the line, Officer Smith continues to a spot down the street where he can watch his progression. And as his quarry at last stands before the agency window, he is directly behind him. Next. That's me. What do you do? Well, anything, mister. I'm, I'm what you might call a handyman. Do anything. Yeah, sort of jack of all trades, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. I want to get work outside of California. I got to leave Los Angeles right away. Mm-hmm. Well, there might be something up in the valley for you. But that's in California. I don't know exactly what I can do with you. That's all right, buddy. I've got a spot for him right here in Los Angeles. Come on, you. Say, what is this? This is what you might call an arrest. You back again, Smith? Yes, sir. This time, I think we've got something. Yeah, like the last time and the time before. No, sir. This fellow fits the description down to the letter. And he was trying to get work out of the state. All right. All right. Bring him in. Yes, sir. Come on in. The lieutenant wants to talk to you. Well, I don't see what... Oh, all right. I'm coming. Right. Lieutenant Condaffer, this is Mr. Huntington. What do you mean, Huntington? My name's Herring. Joe Herring. That's fine, Mr. Herring. Just wanted to get it right. Well, you got it right. Cockeye hearing they call me back in Georgia. Well, suppose you just sit down here, Cockeye. I've got a few questions to ask you, and then I'm going to let a couple of men look you over. Well, for what? I have an idea you know for what, Herring. What was your big hurry to get out of the state? Well, I, I don't like California. It ain't treated me right. Well, no, that's too bad, Mr. Herring. But we'll have to take that up with the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, I'm an actor, see, and, and a good one, too. Back in Georgia, they know how good I am, but Hollywood wouldn't give me a break. Mm, thought maybe you'd be another Ben Turpin, is that it? Listen, I'm better than Turpin. I'm funny, see? Plenty funny. Well, I'm going to give you a chance to prove just how funny you are. Smith, get that Carson fella in here, will you? Yes, sir. I want to see what he has to say. Yes, sir. Uh, who, who's Carson, huh? Oh, he's a gentleman who happened to witness a little fracas the other night. A couple of men who were shot up. One of them's dead now. Yeah? What's that got to do with me? I don't know yet, Cockeye. Okay. Uh, gee, Captain, you... You're not trying to pin something on me, are you? Lieutenant is a rank herring, and we're not in the habit of pinning things on people in this department. It's all up to the people themselves. I don't get you. You will. Right in here, Mr. Carson. Yes, sir. Come in, Mr. Carson. 
I want to introduce hey, you to... that's the bird that did it. Sure as I'm alive. He's the guy, all right. What do you say to that, cockeye? Oh, this guy must be crazy, Cap. I never saw him before in my life. He, he's nuts. No good, Herring. No good at all. As an actor, you're pretty lousy. The following morning, a considerably milder cockeye Herring is removed from his cell and escorted once again into Condapper's office, where he is greeted by an ominous silence. Say, what is this? A funeral or something? Why don't you guys say something? We were waiting for you to talk first, Harry. Well, what do you expect me to say? I suppose I should thank you for putting me up for the night or something. Oh, no, no need of that. You still don't remember anything about a shooting? No. You don't remember standing in a little alleyway down near Griffith and Clinton and shooting a couple of fellows? No. You must be pretty hungry by now, aren't you, Cocker? Say, now, now you're really talking... And that's one thing about me I can sure eat. A couple of nice sandwiches and some hot coffee would taste pretty good right now, wouldn't it? Boy, would it? I... Hey, wait a minute. Well, what are you leading up to? Nothing, Cocker. Nothing at all. Just thought if you were hungry, we might fix you up. There's a plate of sandwiches and a whole pot of coffee in the next room there. Go on. Help yourself. You mean that? Sure. You mean in here? That's right. Just open the door and go on in. Boy, just watch me. Yeah, I don't see no sandwich. Red, what are you doing here? I... Hey, I, why, why'd you run on me the other night? Well, Fulton, you look kind of sick. What's the matter? Have you seen a ghost? Yeah, yeah. So you boys know each other, eh? What are you talking about, huh? What are you trying to do? We've done it, cockeyed. I suppose you spilled the whole story. We know all about your pal, Red Fulton, here. All we need now is your story. How about it? Well, I, I guess I pulled a boner, didn't I? Yeah, that's about it. Well, all right, I, I'll tell you about it. I guess you guys got enough of me to hang me anyway. I guess it doesn't matter much what I say. Take us down, Eddie. But it's like I told you. I come here from Georgia to get in the moving pictures. And it wasn't because I wasn't a good actor that I didn't make it either. Yeah, yeah, sure. We know, Cocky. Now, go ahead with your story. Well, anyway, I, I didn't get anywhere at the studios, and at last I went broke. I only had a couple of dollars left. So I thought maybe some pictures of myself would help, and I went down to Venice Pier and had some made. I was dressed in a cowboy outfit with a with a big gun in my hand and leaning against a big wooden horse. Well, what's all this got to do with your shooting those men? Well, I, I got the pictures, and boy, I looked tough. Really tough. So I sent a couple back to some friends in Georgia, and I, and I told them I was a real hard guy now. Have you ever been confined in any institution, Harry? Institution? You mean bug house? Mm, more or less, yes. Well, of course not. Say, what do you think I am, crazy? Well, your story sounds a little, uh, far-fetched. Well, it, it's true... And I'm not crazy. All right, cock I suppose you go on with it. Well, anyway, after I sent the pictures, I... Well, I began thinking I was a hard guy. You know how you can kid yourself about those things. So I went around town here boasting how I'd killed a couple of guys and a lot of stuff like that, and... Had you? No. I'd never hurt anyone. Well, anyway, finally I was picked up and thrown in the can as a vag, and while I was in there, I met a guy named Delaney. He and I used to talk a lot, and I told him what a hard guy I was, and he believed me. We both got out of the can finally, and, well, he suggested we go up and see an old friend of his, Red Fulton. We went over to Red's place and knocked on his door. Uh, hello, Red. How's the trick? Well, for the limit, when did they let you out? Uh, a couple hours ago. Yeah, meet a pal, Red. This is Cockeye Herring, Red Fulton. Cockeye's a pretty tough lad. Yeah? Well, come on in and park yourself somewhere. Yeah, sure, thanks. Now, Red, what's new? Nothing much. Only I'm plenty sore right at this moment. Yeah? About what? I got into a beef with a couple of guys the other day, and it's left me feeling that way. I'd like to bust their necks, both of them. Well, why don't you? They're pretty big, if you want to know the truth. Oh, I get it. And now that you got it, keep it. Sure, sure. Don't get sore at me, Red. I wouldn't say anything. Why don't you get someone to get them for you? Huh? Say, that's an idea at that. Sure, and I know just the boy to do it. Cockeye here. He's plenty tough, ain't you, Cockeye? Why, uh, sure. Sure, I'm tough. All right. I'll tell you what I'll do. You go out and give those guys a real beating. Black their eyes and break a couple of bones, and I'll pay you 50 bucks. That's how sore I am. Well, well, you see, I... How about it? You want to go? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I thought you said this guy's tough, Delaney. Sure, sure I'm tough. Well, then, how about it? Well, okay, go wrong. Here's the dope. These guys are going to a little beer joint I know about tomorrow night. You go over there, and when you see them, you ask if one of their names... Kind of a spot, not not one to admit I wasn't tough and still being scared to death. And then what happened? Well, I, I figured that in case something went wrong, I'd better take a gun. So I got hold of one and 
The next night, Fulton gave me Mrs. Smith's car and told me where to go and what these guys looked like. He said if I didn't black this Murphy guy's eyes, I wouldn't get the 50 bucks. So I drove over there, and when they showed up, I told them to stick up their hands. I thought that way I could smack them both and beat it. So? Well, so Murphy wouldn't stick up his hands, and they laughed at me. So I let him have it in the stomach. Then the other guy came after me. I let him have it, too. You see, I was scared. You realize what this means for you, don't you, Herring? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, my gosh, I, I didn't really want to shoot anyone. It was just because I'd been boasting about being a hard guy. That's the reason I did it. I couldn't back down. Acting upon this confession, Fulton and Herring are both charged with murder. But after hearing the state's case, Judge Marshal F. McComb dismisses the charge against Fulton, declaring that the prosecution has failed to show that he is linked to any conspiracy to kill either Leslie or Murphy. And one morning, cockeye Herring, Georgia bad man, stands quietly before Judge McComb to receive sentence. You, Mr. Herring, you have been found guilty of the murder of one Robert Leslie. Therefore, it is the sentence of this court that you be confined in the state penitentiary for the remainder of your life. Holy smoke. Furthermore, for the attempted murder of James Murphy, you must serve an additional sentence of from one to 14 years in the state penitentiary. Well, gee, Judge, ain't life enough? What's the 14 years for? Interest? <laughs> Drivers of police cars, ambulances, fire engines are boosters for Rio Grande Cracked gasoline. For more emergency cars are powered with Rio Grande Cracked than any other gasoline everywhere it is sold. No one knows better than these veteran drivers how important it is to use a gasoline that meets emergencies with lightning-like action. You can enjoy the same advantages and the extra thrills of police car performance in your own car with Rio Grande Cracked gasoline. For exactly the same gasoline that these emergency cars use is sold by your neighborhood Rio Grande dealer. Drive in and get a free copy of the Calling All Cars News, that fascinating publication with true detective stories, movie and radio news. Learn how you can supply every boy and girl of your acquaintance with the 14 free gifts that comprise the Rio Grande Junior Detective outfit at no cost to you. And learn about the Sinclair Law of Lubrication that enables your Rio Grande dealer to know exactly what grade of Sinclair motor oil your motor needs and exactly what grade of the 120 different Sinclair lubricants is needed for every part of your car. Sinclair Scientific Lubrication Service, applied according to your car manufacturer's specification, is now available at all 100% Rio Grande stations. I'll send this police calling all cars, attention all cars, to cancellation of broadcast 138. Suspect in this case now in prison. That's all. Rolls in the 